May I welcome all of you um, to the forum, and in particular, uh, those who are uh, in, uh, joining us uh, remotely. Uh, this, is, this, like other events of this kind, is a hybrid event this year. We have uh, a few people here with us on this magnificent ship, the flagship of the Royal Navy, the most advanced uh, carrier uh, ever built, um, uh, but many, many more, several hundred others joining us remotely. Uh, and future uh, Atlantic forums um, of this kind will doubtless, uh, even after COVID, uh, will doubtless involve remote uh, connection as well as people, uh, more people hopefully being present on the carrier. Uh, let me on your behalf uh, thank the First Sea Lord, Admiral Tony Radican, and uh, the captain of HMS Queen Elizabeth, uh, Captain Angus Essenhigh, for their hospitality, for hosting this forum again on HMS uh, Queen Elizabeth, and to the ship's company for the huge efforts you've made uh, to put this, uh, put this together. I was here just a week ago uh, at the end of the NATO exercise that uh, the captain, Captain Angus, referred to. Uh, it was extraordinary to see the last elements of that, the F-35Bs uh, taking off a remarkable aircraft and talking to a US Marine colonel um, who's a, uh, a pilot of one of those uh, aircraft about the, uh, the capabilities that that brings in the modern era, era uh, operating from uh, this ship and ships uh, of this class, and then to have transformed that um, whilst heading back to the home port here in Portsmouth uh, into this forum is a, is a great effort when no doubt many of them were just looking forward to getting uh, off, uh, having some shore leave and seeing their families. So a, a huge thank you, Angus, to you and to the, ships, uh, to the ship's company. As the Prime Minister said, the foundation stone of uh, the Atlantic Alliance was the Atlantic Charter in 19, uh, 1941. And we'll celebrate the 80th anniversary of that next year um, uh, off, uh, the coast of the, off the east coast of the United States with another uh, forum of this kind. And later in the year, this carrier will be in the Pacific um, and will take the values uh, and the um, relationships uh, of the forum uh, to our allies and partners uh, uh, there. So 2021 will be a bumper year uh, uh, as we mark the 80th anniversary of the Atlantic uh, Charter. And it's important uh, that we uh, remember in the modern era, although the NATO alliance, the Atlantic alliance is of course geographically based, in the modern era with countries uh, with a global perspective, obviously the United States, but the UK, the most globalised economy in the G20, one of the most open societies, as the Prime Minister has just set out, uh, embarking upon global Britain in the post-Brexit uh, era, um, that we remember that the Atlantic Alliance must be a global alliance. It was the foundation stone, the Atlantic Charter was the foundation stone not just of the Atlantic Alliance, but of the wider Western and Democratic Alliance. And is that that we mark next year? But this is the Atlantic Future Forum, not the Atlantic um, Past Forum or um, uh, resting on our laurels and simply celebrating our history. And that's why it's critically important that we have our strategic partners, our commercial and business partners with us today. Because in the modern era, national capability is as much as COVID is demonstrating about our economic capability, about our business relationships, uh, as it is about national security, defence uh, and so on. And it's great that we have strategic partners not just from the defence and security sector, uh, but from many other strategic sectors as well. Let me thank uh, our, uh, our partners, BAE Systems, Barclays, Microsoft, Raytheon UK, Northrop Grumman, uh, Fraser Nash, Leonardo, Lockheed Martin, Kinetech, uh, uh, Satels and Thales for their sponsorship uh, not only of this forum, but of the series of uh, forums that will uh, follow. It's great to have you here, and we will not only, uh, ha they're not only attending, but um, many of those uh, individuals, uh, chief executives, uh, and other leaders of business will be uh, on the panels over the next couple of days. Uh, and it's critically important, this is what's unique about this forum, that it brings together the economic security, the economic prosperity agenda uh, together with the classic defence and security agenda. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke at the Oxford Union, uh, where I had last spoken about 30 years uh, before. Um, and whereas it's normally a building with about 700 people in the room baying at you, it was about 70 sitting around in masks, about three metres apart, because they're a particularly um, uh, risk-averse bunch uh, these days. Um, and I was, they, they asked me to talk a bit about um, uh, the strategic picture over the past three decades when I was in government as I 
um, go through my own inflection point and head out into uh, pastures anew. Well, it occurred to me that when I was, if I'd been sitting there 30 whatever years ago and someone had pitched up to talk to me about the previous 30 years, when I, uh, when I was at the end of my university career in the late 80s, then they'd have been talking about Suez, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the Vietnam War. And it struck me that um, the elements that feel really current uh, to, to me, all of you uh, probably also feel that life has gone pretty quickly over the past few decades. You don't feel that different to the way you felt you did in your mid-20s or your early 20s. But uh, if I talked about essentially the previous 30 years, it would feel as relevant to them as Suez or Cuba, the Cuban Missile Crisis or whatever would to me. So what instead I did was try to talk to them about the next 30 years and the issues they'll face uh, in their careers as we head towards the middle part of the century. And I think it's important, given this is a future forum, that we focus on those issues too. And I want to talk briefly about both trends and shocks that I think will um, help shape some of the conversations over the next couple of days and beyond. There are five big global trends I think we just need to keep in mind. The biggest of all is, of course, the environment. Not just climate change, the challenge of biodiversity, and the challenge of adapting to the inevitable climate change that will happen, um, uh, in any case, by the middle part uh, of the century. On current predictions, even if we all achieve uh, net zero carbon by then, and that's uh, an immense uh, challenge, as the Prime Minister said, with building back uh, greener, the temperatures will still rise and the weather will become uh, more volatile. And so climate adaptation and resilience is going to be as much a part of our agenda as driving towards net zero. And the same sectors, industry, transport, housing, energy, agriculture, are going to have to uh, uh, make investments to deal with climate resilience as they are to contribute to net zero. And that's an immense economic uh, re reorientation. It's also important um, that we have the biodiversity agenda in mind because that's an important part of the... You don't have to be a, an aficionado, aficionado of the Gaia hypothesis uh, to recognise that that is an important part of the regulation of the global, uh, the global system. Second, demographics. Um, by the middle part of this century, um, the only part of the world that won't have an ageing population will be sub-Saharan Africa. By the end of the century, 40% of the world's working age population will be in sub-Saharan Africa. That is a huge shift. And every other part of the world, including uh, developing and growing economies like China, like India, will have ageing populations. One of the biggest challenges that those countries uh, will face. And just, to, just think about the intersection between those two sets of issues. Um, if, as a result of climate change, as we expect, the Sahara spread south and there aren't enough jobs and economic opportunities for those young people in sub-Saharan Africa. Inevitably, migration flows will result. People will head north with an impact on the economies, societies, politics of North Africa and, of course, of the European continent. And these are this intersection of some of these big trends are uh, the issues on which I think we should focus our attention over the next few years. Third, tech, the fourth industrial revolution. Um, this, because of the combination of technologies that are going to come together, um, uh, quantum computing, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, synthetic biology, autonomous, um, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. This will transform defence and government, but it will transform our economies and will probably have a more profound impact on our societies, urban patterns of urbanisation, for example, the intergenerational relationships, than any of the previous industrial uh, revolutions since the first. Jobs that have hitherto remained the preserve of people, uh, large parts of them will be automated, as they have been in previous revolutions. This one will be automating white-collar jobs, whereas previous ones have automated blue-collar jobs. And that's a profound change to the structure of our economies. And we've seen the vulnerability of an economy that is essentially post-industrial, or largely post-industrial, as ours is, over three quarters of the British economy um, on the supply side driven by services, on the demand side by consumption. And of course, those were the two things hit hardest uh, by the lockdown and why the economic impact uh, in the UK and in, in other countries with the same economic structure of the UK was so sharp. Fourth, the shift of the global centre of gravity to the Pacific. And this is about, of course, the rise of China, but not just the rise of China. Um, the, source of global, the source of global growth in other countries in that region, Vietnam, Indonesia, Taiwan, Japan still, South Korea, and so on. Um, and that is a very pro profound geopolitical shift, 
President Obama was the first Pacific president, born in Hawaii with a very Pacific orientation. He certainly won't be uh, the last. And that's a challenge for us in this hemisphere because um, the American perspective, as we can see, is shifting to what to them is the West, even though to us it's the Far East. Uh, and that's a profound shift in our uh, relationships. And then finally, and coming back to, if you like, core national security issues, there's the fact that um, uh, interstate competition or rivalry, and of course that is now increasingly sharp between the United States and China especially, is um, multi-domain. Not just the traditional land, sea and air that our predecessors would have thought about, or even space, um, which of course was an important domain in the uh, contest of the Cold War, but cyberspace and the information space um, as well. And what that means is that we need to think of national security in a different way. You know, national security 1.0, if you like, was the defense of the realm. National security 2.0 was the defense of the realm plus keeping our citizens safe from non-state threats like terrorism and serious and organized crime. And of course, those have dominated the public debate about national security and many of our previous defense reviews and so on over the past 15, 20 years or so. National security 3.0, I mean, you can argue this in different ways. I'm just, you know, this is just a way of describing it, is going to encompass all of those things, but it will also encompass economic security for the reasons I've set out, environmental uh, security, um, health security, as we've learned because of COVID, and, of course, democratic security. We've seen over the past few years with these relentless, insidious, grey zone type attacks, mostly from Russia, many of them not um, uh, 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 emerging directly from arms of the Russian state, but from private um, uh, institutions co-opted uh, in that uh, endeavour, uh, have been seeking to undermine the relationship between the citizen uh, and the state, confidence in democratic institutions, confidence in the electoral process and so on. And so all of these things, democratic security, health, environmental, economic security, are as much a part of national and global security in the next quarter of the 21st century as defense of the realm, keeping our citizens safe, um, uh, was in the first quarter of the 21st century, or has been in the first quarter of the 21st century and before. But if we think about what happens against the background of those huge global trends, of course, most eras and most um, uh, uh, national security challenges, at least, um, have been dominated by shocks. Uh, as I enter government, the biggest, we had essentially the biggest shock of all, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War, the collapse uh, of the Soviet Union. But we then had the dot-com bubble in the 1990s, 9-11. Uh, the 2008 financial crisis, which was probably the biggest national security event of the 21st century, bigger than 9-11 in its far-reaching effects on the global order. The Great Tsunami, the Arab Spring, the 2014 and 2016 referendums in this country, um, which have dominated uh, our politics um, uh, over the past uh, decade. And of course, uh, the most recent and arguably the biggest of all, uh, COVID, um, uh, where we've seen the impact of the health crisis that's arisen from the pandemic. We've now had the economic impact. We don't yet know what the geopolitical um, and uh, wider global impact will be. But if you look at the history of pandemics and economic shocks of the scale of this one, biggest pandemic in a century, biggest economic shock since the, uh, since the depression, then uh, geopolitical effects, unpredictable geopolitical effects follow. There will be some as a result of this. We know one already. Um, the sharpening rivalry between the US and China, as essentially both are setting out uh, to establish that um, their system, our system in the case of the US, um, uh, essentially authoritarian and state capitalism in the case of China, um, is, uh, ha has the superior model for the recovery. The Prime Minister spoke uh, uh, very eloquently about the principles he believes we need to uh, entrench in our own recovery, build back better, build back greener, um, uh, 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 enhance our investment in technology, level up around uh, the UK, ensure that uh, the Western democracies and our model are competing successfully, not with a completely different ideology as we found during the Cold War, but with a, um, a different version 
of the capitalist um, uh, economy, which is not market economies and, and democratic governance, but authoritarian governance and uh, much bigger uh, uh, state role. And the recovery from COVID um, is um, being interpreted not as an opportunity as in 2008 for the world to work together to bring uh, the world economy back into equilibrium, but as a competition between these two rival, uh, two rival systems. And that's just a factor of uh, the era in which we uh, operate. I don't know, none of us knows, um, I'd be a billionaire if I did, um, what the shocks will be over the next 30 years. I'd know what to sell short and buy long and all that kind of stuff. None of us knows what those shocks will be, uh, but there will be some, because that is the nature of um, the, the geopolitical era in which we operate. I'd be willing to put a, a certain amount of money that there will be some kind of shock related to the environment. We had the great tsunami um, with rising temperatures, more, vo more volatile weather. My guess is that at some point there will be some kind of an event that relates to uh, climate change at some point in the next few decades. Uh, it's quite likely there'll be an economic shock of some kind. Uh, the risks of a trade war, the impact of that on inflation, uh, on the debt imbalances that we see that have obviously uh, increased as a, uh, uh, as a result of the response uh, to COVID, uh, well, uh, there's a, there's, there must be a realistic risk of that kind of shock uh, as well. And who knows, there could be political shocks. Um, you know, one of the things that authoritarian countries uh, don't generally tend to do as well as democratic countries is succession planning. Um, and sometimes there are political shocks as you get generational change um, in regimes of that kind. And uh, as we've seen, those can, if it's an important country, those can, uh, those can, spill, uh, those can spill out. Uh, and uh, several countries, including some in our own hemisphere, are having to wrestle with um, how do they entrench a smooth succession to people who've been in power uh, for a long time. But these are the sort of challenges we'll find ourselves uh, facing and countries where we, you know, like, like Russia, for example, where we currently are focused on their strength and assertiveness, we may well find ourselves in 10 years' time worrying about their stability, uh, given, the, um, given the frictions and tensions uh, that exist within uh, a, 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 an economy and country uh, of that kind with the, the issues that they face uh, around them. So, um, uh, uh, because I'm no longer in government, I don't know what is going to be in the integrated review when it is, um, uh, when it is uh, launched. Uh, the clue, as I uh, said in a BBC interview just earlier on, is in the title. It's integrated. Uh, and that's essentially building on the fusion doctrine that we developed in the National Security Capability Review of 2017. It is critically important that our defence reviews in the future are not defence reviews. They are genuinely integrated. They bring together... Um, the capabilities of government right the way across um, the, the spectrum, defence, diplomacy, development, um, uh, trade relationships, etc., and the capabilities of the private sector and the capabilities uh, of the uh, third sector. But what I know will have to be a theme of this, um, or two themes of it, are agility, because we know that we can't just posture ourselves against a single kind of national security threat. Uh, the balance is shifting. Interstate competition is more of a feature than it was five or ten years ago, but the non-state threats have not gone away um, and at any point could re-emerge to, uh, to threaten us. And the nature of the state threats, for the reasons I've set out, could evolve, certainly over the period of procurement cycles and posture that um, need to prevail in uh, defence and security uh, capabilities. So agility, the ability to apply different techniques um, to new threats and existing techniques to, and capabilities to new threats will have to be a feature of this. And we know what that looks like. Our response to Salisbury was essentially um, bringing together our counter-terrorism investigative capabilities developed over a long period to track down really um, tight, secure networks of uh, violent extremists who, carry out, who were willing to carry out terrorist attacks and many of the techniques the investigative and intelligence techniques we had developed for the, for the uh, terrorist threat, we applied to the investigation to Salisbury to identify the two culprits and so on. I think that took uh, the Russians uh, by surprise. But alongside that, we brought to bear our um, capabilities in law enforcement 
to go after some of the dirty money and other um, uh, uh, malign behaviours we see operating through the private sector, and of course uh, a diplomatic effort to expel large numbers uh, of Russian diplomats and, in, and indeed their entire military intelligence presence um, here in the UK. That's an example of bringing together a whole load of different capabilities, a great example, bringing together a whole load of different capabilities, including one which, by the way, our adversaries don't have, alliances, um, to bear on a threat that we simply weren't expecting and took us, uh, uh, undoubtedly took us by surprise. It's that kind of agility that we will need to apply over the next uh, several decades. The other big principle, um, as well as this being integrated across our own sets of capabilities, must be allied by design. This is a capability, as I said, our adversaries do not have. You know, they don't have the kind of relationships that the Prime Minister mentioned that go all the way back to the Atlantic Charter uh, in 1941. But we do. And it's an enormous um, asset for us and for our way of life and to protect the interests and values uh, of, our, uh, of our people. So allied by design um, is going to be uh, a posture that I would expect to see for a, for a country with the scale and capability of the UK, allied by design, operating at the heart of allied operations alongside the United States who have the scale, of course, to operate uh, on their own should they choose to do so. But for us, it will be much more effective, um, whether it's in defence diplomacy or actually military operations, if we're bringing, uh, as the framework nation, other key allies with us. And we're seeing the development of that, not just in the deployment of the carriers, the NATO exercise last week had American aircraft and British aircraft, as you, hear, as you heard, uh, operating from the deck in a completely seamless way, not as separate squadrons, as integrated, interoperable, interchangeable um, capability. You see it with the Joint Expeditionary Force, which brings together the UK and uh, nine other Nordic and Baltic nations into uh, an expeditionary capability of the kind, had we had it a decade ago, we would probably have deployed uh, into the Afghanistan and Iraq uh, theatres, and that's the kind of capability we'll need to design uh, for the future. But overall, for the Alliance, what are the principles that um, I think uh, 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 should guide us through the next several decades? Well, there are really three I just want to touch on uh, quite, uh, quite briefly. Um, a, a reassertion of the global rule of law, a revision to the world economic settlement, and a revival of the unity of purpose of the Western uh, Democratic Alliance. And if we can do all of those things, and I believe this country, um, uh, with the global Britain vision that we have, can play a, <coughs> excuse me, a pivotal role in uh, advancing uh, those principles, then I think we will be in good shape as we reach the middle part of the century over the next 30 years, and some of those students are um, standing here and sitting there. Um, to be confident that we uh, are advancing our national interest and the interests of our citizens and allies. So first, just briefly, the global rule of law. Um, it is the case that, of course, uh, we're only going to be friends and allies with countries that share our values. Those, re those really are, as you heard from the Prime Minister, those, that is really the foundation of friendship and of alliance between two countries. But that doesn't mean we can't do business with other countries that, ha uh, that have different governance systems, and in some areas, maybe um, uh, adversarial with us. If I think about China, for example, clearly the biggest uh, shift in the security and economic environment in the world in the modern era, there are areas where, where, where we will uh, uh, contest uh, China, as we've seen most recently over Hong Kong, but with freedom of uh, navigation operations in the South China Sea and so on, where it's important that we assert our own position. There are areas where we must, must cooperate with China, notably on the big environmental challenges, climate change, biodiversity and so on. And in 2021, as we're chairing COP26, the big climate change conference, China will be chairing the, uh, the partner to that, a big international biodiversity uh, conference, and we need to make those efforts work together. But we must cooperate with China if we are to tackle the big environmental challenges, and indeed with other countries around the world with different political systems to ours and where their values are discordant from ours. And of course, then in the, between those two, there's a whole area, a range of areas, where I would expect us to compete, notably uh, economically, but the rules of that competition have to be fair 
um, established, stable uh, and enforced. And that brings me on to the second point, um, some revisions to the world economic uh, uh, settlement. Um, uh, now I've left government as well as chairing the Atlantic uh, Future Forum, I'm, uh, I've been asked by the Prime Minister to chair a G7 panel on global economic resilience. One of the things that COVID revealed to us is that globalization essentially unfettered, unmanaged, has led in some areas and in some sectors and markets to over-specialization, to supply chains that are, are, uh, uh, are vulnerable and where there are single points of failure. And we saw that in some examples uh, on COVID. But in other areas, uh, we've seen that over-specialization uh, and, and under-management of the global uh, economic uh, uh, system has allowed monopolistic um, uh, uh, institutions to grow up, um, sometimes in protected market, and that leads to market uh, distortions that can affect the competitiveness of Western companies, indeed the viability of Western companies to compete in the global market. If that's the case when it, with an economy, the scale in, uh, of the Chinese economy, which is not just the Chinese economy, then of course some, uh, a, a company that is um, uh, large enough to be competitive in China is going to have a global presence as well. And you can think of examples of this, notably, for example, in the telecommunications area. Well, just as at the national level, and indeed at the multilateral level within Europe, with the EU, we have to regulate markets to maintain competitiveness, to ensure uh, that the, uh, the citizens' um, uh, interests are protected, we will need to um, regulate uh, global markets uh, in some sectors at least more effectively than we do at the moment and that's part of what this G7 panel is going to look at. It does not mean wholesale changes in my own view. There'll be some areas of activity which all countries will want to remain sovereign, particularly critical national infrastructure and so on. There will be most areas of activity where essentially the unfettered globalization model, the free trading model of which this country has been a champion, will continue to apply and will be completely uh, in our interests. It's been a huge driver of prosperity worldwide and of course has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in China and is showing signs of doing so in India as it has in Vietnam and other countries of that kind. But there will be some sectors where we wish to preserve the benefits of globalization, the economies of scale that you get, the competitive edge that you get uh, in markets where national markets are simply not big enough to deliver that, but where we'll want those to be um, from uh, countries and systems uh, where the partnerships are trusted. Because it's not quite critical national infrastructure, it doesn't quite have to be sovereign, but we do want to be confident uh, that it's operating um, uh, among allies uh, and uh, trusted partners with systems that we can count on, where intellectual property is protected, where regulation um, is uh, enforced, um, where monopolies are uh, and monopolistic practices are properly, uh, properly tackled. And that, I think, is the area that we need to examine some changes in the settlement, and that's where I would expect uh, this G7 uh, panel to focus its attention. In a sense, we already have that in some sectors, including some of the sectors where companies are represented, uh, represented here. If you're running BAE Systems or Lockheed Martin and so on, you're used to that kind of world. But there are other sectors where we may need to apply some of the same uh, considerations. We don't want to lose the benefits of globalization. We don't want to um, essentially uh, lurch into protectionism, and there's clearly a risk of that uh, more generally. We want to find an alternative that enables us to pursue the benefits of globalization, but uh, to generate resilience and confidence in areas uh, where we really need it. And so that's that second area. And then third is um, revival of the Western Alliance. Now, the Western Alliance is in pretty good shape. I mean, let's, you know, it, it's easy for us to um, worry about these things and we have our ups and downs and we have our rows and we have our frictions and we always have. Even two of the people you saw on the video clip who were you know, notoriously close, uh, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, went through some very, very rough moments um, over national security choices um, that they made in, that, in the decade of the 1980s when both were focused on the existential threat of the Soviet Union. So we mustn't overstate the frictions that have existed between us um, uh, and within the Western alliance and the democratic countries in the modern era, but equally we mustn't be complacent about them uh, either. And when we see trade disputes 
that become national security disputes, or we see national security um, arguments used to sanction your normal, um, uh, normal business, then um, we are stepping down a path that I can you know, personally consider to be quite dangerous to the unity and coherence uh, of the Western Alliance. And it's that unity and coherence, as I said, it's, an, it's a capability, we should think of it as such, that our, our adversaries don't have, that is uh, going to ensure that our values, the system that speaks to um, not only our peoples, but peoples around the world, you know, how, many, you know, how many people um, want a green card for some of, the, um, you know, some of our adversaries as opposed to the United States or the UK uh, and so on? It speaks to the human spirit. We've got to have some confidence in our own system and not be mesmerised by the challenge, but invest in it, but invest in the unity of it as well. And that it does mean American leadership, but it also means the rest of us sharing the burden more equitably. As Jim Mattis said, the United States cannot care more about the security of our children in this continent than we do uh, ourselves. And this is not a, a, a unique feature to the Trump administration, although he obviously expresses these things more vividly than some of his predecessors might. This is a long-standing irritant in the transatlantic relationship. Um, and uh, in this continent, it is critical that we show we're willing to step up, share the burden, um, lead in our own neighbourhood, uh, invest in defence and security, invest in resilience, make the hard choices, even as we seek um, the American uh, leadership um, that is so important to the coherence of the uh, Western uh, alliance. And so with that, I hope that gives you some food uh, for thought. Let me welcome you all uh, once more uh, to this event. This is an event at which thought leadership, at least, um, is an opportunity for us to think about uh, the nature of that alliance, an alliance that began with the Atlantic Charter. The UK and US were not allies uh, at the time that Roosevelt and, and uh, Churchill met on HMS uh, Prince of Wales. Indeed, Churchill regards, re later regarded his biggest contribution to the war effort, um, building the alliance with the Americans and bringing the Americans to bear um, in the Allied cause. And that was the foundation stone not just of the US-UK special relationship, which has been a beacon to the world ever since, but of the Atlantic Alliance, um, encapsulated in NATO, and we'll be hearing from Jens Stoltenberg um, uh, later uh, in this event, and into that wider Western Alliance, economic as well as security, um, uh, focused on prosperity as well as uh, defense, um, that has served us, our two countries, and the wider allied um, community, uh, and democratic community so well over the past few decades. As I said, it does require leadership, and it, but it does require leadership from America's allies as much as it requires leadership from the United States herself. And so uh, it's my great pleasure um, in concluding my own remarks to hear about that leadership from a uh, friend and colleague, Admiral Mike uh, Gilday, the Chief of Naval Operations of the United States, and Tony Radican's friend and opposite number. So, Admiral, if we've queued properly, I know I've got a minute and a half to go, but I'm not going to talk for another minute and a half. Uh, 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 if we've queued properly, let's bring up uh, the Admiral. Thank you very much.